to view this table, understand what's available to you. In real life, if you have mission critical applications inside of Azure, guess what? You're going to use Premier to work with that environment. So let me go back into the slides real quick. We also have alternative support channels. We have our MSDN Azure forums, we have Stack Overflow, we have Server Fault, we have a general feedback channel. We also have a Twitter channel. Now, I heard a chuckle. I heard a chuckle all the way across everybody listening to me. Twitter really mad, are you serious? At Azure support. Now, folks, I cannot stress to you, you have full-time Microsoft employees on this channel. You have community members which are called Microsoft Valuable Specialists on this channel. What I'm trying to tell you is just don't make fun of it because it's Twitter. You have 400 level experts on these channels. And even in some cases from the Microsoft perspective, our employees have to be on the channel to help support our customers in this way. So you have very, very smart people here asking questions. So don't, you know, don't look at this going, hey, you know, it's Twitter, it's just going to be community advice. No, chances are you're going to have a full-time Microsoft employee that's deep in whatever you're asking, answering your question at a 400 level depth for free because it's inside of Twitter. Now, I don't know if I'd run a business on it, but folks, the folks there are the same folks you might get through Premier, through other agreements that are available to you. This is not always there for you. There, there's no SLA and how bad, quick they'll respond to the Twitter, but it's definitely something you want to look at inside of Azure. We also have a knowledge center where you can query our knowledge center looking for different help, looking for virtual machines. A lot of documentation's up there. A lot of known issues might be up there. Kind of like the old TechNet uh, event center, where if you had an event ID, you could put it in there and get an idea of what it's going to be. We have a knowledge center where you can go and get help. It's a searchable database. But we also have the ability to open a support request. Now let's have some fun with this. Now if Azure's behaving properly, let me show you how we open a support request, but more importantly, let me show you some of the things that Azure does on our behalf. So I'm going to hop back into my portal here, and I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom and choose help and support. Now I'm going to start the story here, how I open a support request, but I want to show you a little trick and I'm going to come back to the screen. If I go into my virtual machines, and I go into one of my virtual machines, like FunVM2, and I scroll all the way down, I also have a new support request. The great thing about this, when I go here, it automatically fills in the contacts where I'm at. So it says, hey, you're running a virtual machine, running Windows, it's called FunVM2. It's already started to fill in the help and request tool for me, so I don't have to do it. By the way, pretty much everywhere inside of Azure, that new support request is available to you, so you can save some time if you know you're having problems with a specific resource. Now I want to take you kind of the long way so I can show you what this looks like from, uh, from the get-go. So I'm going to go and scroll back down and go back into help and support. And they give us our community, there's our Twitter channel, we can access it right from the portal. I'm going to simply say new support request. It's going to say, what's your issue? Is it technical, billing, what's going on? We'll say this is technical. It's going to ask what subscription I'm going to have. It's also going to select a service. Uh, I'm having problem with a virtual machine uh, running Windows. It's going to say what resource. I'm having trouble with the RBAC test VM. Um, in a words, uh, won't connect. What's my problem type? Uh, cannot connect to my VM. What's my sub problem type? Uh, my configuration is impacted. We'll say put that one in there. Um, and notice what comes up. Hey, this is it's it's stopped and it's deallocating that machine. It's actually looking at this going. Hey, something's on with this machine. The virtual machine is stopped and deallocated. In other words, turn it on. So when we go through the support and request, Azure has some technology behind it that's going to say, you know what? There's something wrong. And in this case, I knew the machine was turned off, and this tool told me. So it ran across my subscription. It even gives me some recommended best steps to how to actually move forward inside of there. So I have the ability to troubleshoot this. I chose this machine perfectly because it is turned off. It's going to get those high-level basics but this may not be enough for you. If I go next to details, this is where it comes in. You see my subscription. Hey, look, hey, why don't you call somebody and pay for a plan? If you have a premier agreement and you have a technical account manager, what'll happen from here is it'll actually open up the rest of the support request details. You'll fill in some information and the technical account manager will get that request and then run for it. Most likely you're gonna get a phone call. Uh, depending on the severity, usually within a few minutes with I think guaranteed within an hour uh, you'll hear from somebody at Microsoft and you'll start quarterbacking and solving whatever that problem is. So knowing how to open a support and request is very important to our Azure environment. It's very important for you uh, as a customer to help. How do you get help? If something breaks, how do you work inside of it? How do you actually deal with those issues? And even if you don't have a pre premier agreement, you have ways to get plans, pay for support instance, so you can help get resolution to whatever problem. And I hope you don't have any problems, but if you do, there's a lot of help here, a lot of free help. And if you have to go pay for somebody, it's fairly reasonable when we take a look at the support issues that you might have to, to pay for. So let me go ahead and switch back in. 
And let's finish up some of the other topics inside of this module that are here. And let's talk about service level agreements. Every Azure service inside of your subscriptions have service level agreements. Now, with the exception of virtual machines, where you have to configure them in certain ways or use availability sets or availability zones, you have service level agreements. And all this basically means is, you know what? We define how much guaranteed uptime you have for a product. And if we as a company don't meet that requirement, we're going to pay you back a credit. They're financially backed service level agreements, but it talks about how, our def how we define how things are going to be performant for you. So when you have outages, how do we give you credits to say that? And, and trust me, here at Microsoft, we hate outages just as much as you do, and we work really hard to resolve them. And how do we work with that, and how do we help meet those requirements? So first off, understand what we mean by service level agreements. It's measured in uptime, and every Microsoft product has anywhere between three nines to four nines on the average of uptime. What does that mean? Well, if you're three nines, that means downtime per year, per month, 43 minutes, downtime for an entire year at worst would be eight, eight hours. If we don't adhere to that, you get credits based on that service. We guarantee that monthly request, and you might have some of your monthly fees waived, you might be getting accredited, it all depends on what that outage looks like. Now, some resources inside of Azure, guess what? We have different service level agreements on how you configure it. So Cosmos uh, database, for example, if you configure it in a certain read-only perspective, you can get up to five nines. And that's where our service is. Now we talked about storage. Storage has its own SLA, and just kind of a fun note. L uh, locally redundant storage, LRS, nine nines by default, and GRS, the last time I checked, 16 nines of availability. So we have different availability levels in our different areas of Azure. Now the challenge becomes is when you start working with multiple Azure services that have different SLAs. So as the writing of this slide, we had an SLA for the app services, which is uh, three and a half nines, and Azure SQL Database had four nines. How do you calculate what the actual service level agreement is? You calculate it by multiplying the two percentages together and you come up with what's called a composite SLA. It is always going to be lower than the lowest composite, and the reason being is we have to factor in multiple points of failure here. We could have a failure at the web app, which impacts the SLA for SQL and vice versa, so we have to be able to calculate it. And that would be what we'd have to adhere to as Microsoft for the SLA for that solution. Now, why do I show you this? Because you have to understand how to calculate it. You have to understand how it works with it. If you get a question like this on any of your exams, and just a general broad statement, if you get a question on any of your exams that requires you to do math, you do not have to do it in, the, in your brain. You'll be provided the Microsoft calculator to solve that problem. If you get this question on your exam, you simply multiply the two percentages together, and it'll give you the resulting percentage. And they just show you on the slide here, take it down to the decimal points, and they'll tell you what that actual percentage is. But understand we have those composite SLAs to help factor in the multiple points of failure. Application SLAs, when you start building those requirements, design for resilience availability. You determine the SLA based on what those application needs are going to be. Look at the metrics behind that application. How long does it take to recover? Or how long do we uh, tolerate failures? If you have recovery inside of that, what's our RPO, recovery point objective? What's our RTO, recovery time objective? How long do we bring these things back? So when you start looking at your applications, you have to look at a lot of factors. Like for example, we had the app services and the SQL database. Well, is there a way we can choose another service that has an higher, higher SLA than app services to do the same thing? These are questions you ask when you start architecting solutions inside of Azure, and then you build to those availability requirements. And when you look at things like virtual machines, by simply putting things in availability zone, you get four nines guaranteed SLA for those virtual machines that are in that availability zone. So we have all kinds of ways to do that. One of the last topics we're gonna get into is service lifecycle management. When we take a look at all our products inside of our service lifecycle, we have three big stages. And along those stages, we have different costs and different SLA and support will come to bear. We have private preview. Private preview, very simply much, product is being reviewed by the product group. Generally, it's an invite only. We're looking for a very specific type of customer doing a very specific type of scenario. We'll do that over feature. Now, if that feature survives through private preview, it goes to public preview where customers then can open and test it. Remember, and we talked about this, I believe, in module two, uh, when you're in preview products, do not put production stuff, do not produ put production stuff, do not put production stuff in preview. Friends don't let friends put stuff in production in preview. Hey, Matt? Yes. Should I put my production workload in preview? No. Oh, okay. All right. You can, by the way, and this is the challenge. We can put production stuff in here. Don't do it. Why? 
because there's no guarantee the product will make it out of preview. Now, with that said, we have a lot of faith in our product group. When things hit public preview, they're normally going to make general availability. How long that takes depends on the product. Generally, it's within six months to a year. When it hits public preview, it's going to become generally availability. That's when you can put things in production. You use general availability. That's when it gets a cost. That's when it gets an official SLA and it gets official support, but not until it becomes GA along that life cycle. All right. So you also have the ability, um, we change our porter often, and this is a challenge for Garrett and his team and for myself, is that we do live demonstrations. And so I never know what the portal is going to look like, but I can look at a preview of the portal. Everybody, customers, you have the ability, if you go to preview.portal.azure.com, guess what? You can get a preview portal experience. Now, it's a little flaky every now and again. You might have some refreshes where you have to work with it, but we're trying to navigate and give you the best experience. You have an ability to get feedback in a forum. You also have to report a bug. Say, hey, look, we're having an issue with this particular portal. We can give feedback back to the product group to design a better portal experience for you. And I will tell you, folks, I have seen so many wonderful changes from the initial Azure portal to where we're at today. They really want to make the experience easy and intuitive, and you can kind of see what we're working on by going to Preview Portal. You have the ability to work with it, and it'll be on your production environment. Now, quite frankly, if you're really doing everything day to day and you need to be there, don't use the preview portal. It's something if you want to test and kind of explore, but if you're trying to really do stuff inside of Azure, go to the real portal, portal.azure.com, because it's going to be that full functionality. You don't have to worry about any potential bugs uh, that are going to be there. We also publish our, not only can you look at the preview of our, for, uh, of our portal, you can look at the roadmap of our products. You have the ability to get into our roadmap and see what we're working on. Now, when you go into our roadmap, it'll show you what features we have currently in preview, what are in private preview, what features we've deprecated. In other words, sometimes when a new feature comes out in Azure, we're going to pull its old feature out. We're going to let you know that. We have the ability to look at the roadmap. You can do a quick search on the internet and do a search for the roadmap. You can look at all the data that's there. Now, the one thing I will prepare you for when you go to the roadmap, don't expect dates. We very rarely will tell you what the dates are for the resources. We're going to tell you, hey, here's a new feature we're working on. Here's why we're working on it. Here's if, it, if it's a public preview or private preview. Here's where you can possibly sign up and go inside of it. So you can monitor those resources and work with it. So as you can see, even though we focused on the, the updates and you can see what's there, there's a lot to do with pricing and support. And folks, in real life, you may not do a lot of this, but know the calculator. If you do work in the community, know how to get the free service inside of Azure. Know what's there and know how to purchase. Be a little smart about licensing when you start having those costs inside of Azure. But for your exam, folks, there's a lot of memorization here. Know the support plans. Know the different way we can acquire Azure. Know the different tools we can use to control Azure costs from reservations to hybrid benefit as an example. So when you get ready to take your exams, module four is pretty important. And really, it is part of fundamental. How do we price and support our stuff? We have to know this at a real high level. But when you get in your exams, just a little bit of memorization here goes a long, long way. And that brings us to the end of module four. Thank you all for joining us over the last two days to learn about Azure Fundamentals. Today, we covered Module 3, discussing security, privacy, compliance, and trust. And then we finished with Module 4, where we talked about Azure pricing and support options. Congratulations to you. You made it through both days with us, and you've officially completed this course. We wish you good luck on your exams, and happy studying.